try that one more time. Good evening. Good evening. Much better. I want to welcome you here tonight. Uh, glad you can be here with us uh, for this one of the really the most important services we do all year. And really beautiful one. I want to thank uh, Roxanne and Sid and Jill and everybody who put the sanctuary together here tonight for communion. It really is a beautiful, powerful reminder of why we're here as we commemorate and celebrate what Jesus did on our behalf 2,000 years ago on the cross. Uh, our scripture tonight is going to be on screen, and I'd like you to read it with me. And we're doing it on screen because you all don't have a lot of light to read a paper Bible with tonight. Partly that's the reason. The other part is I want you to hear it in your own voice as we read through the message of what God did on our behalf. I want you to say it out loud and hear it because we don't just remember what we hear, we remember what we speak. And you would have a hard time finding something more important to speak than what we're about to read. So would you join me in reading the word of God out of Matthew 26. On the first day of the festival of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, where do you want us to prepare the Passover meal for you? As you go into the city, he told them, you will see a certain man. Tell him, the teacher says, my time has come and I will eat the Passover meal with my disciples at your house. So the disciples did as Jesus told them and prepared the Passover meal there. When it was evening, Jesus sat down at the table with the twelve. While they were eating, he said, I tell you the truth, one of you will betray me. Greatly distressed, each one asked in turn, Am I the one, Lord? He replied, One of you who has just eaten from this bowl will betray me. For the Son of Man must die as the scriptures declared long ago, but how terrible it will be for the one who betrays him. It would be far better for that man if he had never been born. Judas, the one who would betray him, also asked, Rabbi, am I the one? And Jesus told him, you have said it. As they were eating, Jesus took some bread and blessed it, and then he broke it in pieces and gave it to the disciples, saying, Take this and eat it, for this is my body. And he took a cup of wine and gave thanks to God for it. He gave it to them and said, Each of you drink from it, for this is my blood, which confirms a covenant between God and his people. It is poured out as a sacrifice to forgive the sins of many. Mark my words, I will not drink wine again until the day I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Then they sang a hymn and went out to the Mount of Olives. On the way, Jesus told them, Tonight all of you will desert me, for the scriptures say, God will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I have been raised from the dead... I will go ahead of you to Galilee and meet you there. Peter declared, even if everyone else deserts you, I will never desert you. Jesus replied, I tell you the truth, Peter, this very night before the rooster crows, you will deny three times that you even know me. No, Peter insisted, <clears throat> even if I have to die with you, I will never deny you. And all the other disciples bowed the same. Let's pray. Uh, Father, on this night, we pray that your spirit will take your message and do in us what you intended it to do from the beginning. That in hearing the good news of Jesus Christ, your love demonstrated in the gift of your son that we would find hope and life forgiveness and peace 
and new life that lasts forever. We just confess that we need you. We need you more than we know. And tonight we pray that your spirit, who is here with us now, would do a good work in us. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> so why is Good Friday good? Have you ever had a kid ask you that question? Uh, he was betrayed, arrested, put on trial, brutally killed, mocked, abandoned. What's good about it? <clears throat> it's good because Jesus walked into everything that we run from so that we could stop running in all the gospel records, Jesus was fully aware in advance of his betrayal, arrest, and crucifixion. And yet he did not turn away from it. He did not walk away. He did not run. He walked straight into it. And he chose to walk into what we run from. He chose to walk into suffering and shame and abandonment and death. What we avoid, he accepted. What we run from, he acquiesced to. Now, we do take precautions to avoid pain, don't we? And shame and death and suffering, do we do anything to try and avoid those things? Help me out, people. <laughs> we like to stay on the right side of the water, right? It's not good if you're on the wrong side of the water especially if the water's frozen, right? It's very important to stay on the right side of the ice. It's very important not to hit the ice when you don't mean to, right? You'll break your hip. You'll break your arm. You'll break your head. <clears throat> don't get hit by a car, right? Don't get hit by a truck. It's dark out there. They drive too fast. They don't slow down. Wear something that will protect you. Wear something that will protect you so you don't get bit by the chainsaw. Where is Mike Pence? He's probably got a couple stories. <laughs> you don't want to get bit by the chainsaw. It's not good. In fact, truth is, you don't even want to get bit by the ticks anymore. Those little ticks... And those mosquitoes, do you know mosquitoes are more deadly than lions? And rhinos and elephants and crocodiles combined. Do you know a mosquito can kill you? Put a helmet on, right? <clears throat> you tell your kids, you tell your husband, because you don't want to get bit by the asphalt doesn't end well. And don't get me started on these. Raise a hand if you own one. <laughs> if you know what this is for, you know we don't live here forever, right? If we started talking about that, we'd never get done. You live long enough and it starts to seem like life is dangerous, <clears throat> even fatal. And so we have all these things that we do to stay out of the way of pain, suffering, shame, and death. And Jesus walked straight into it so that you and I could stop running. So sometimes the Lord, well, the Lord always knows when a preacher needs some help. And sometimes the Lord gives us things, uh, usually illustrations, once in a while an outline. So I'm at the in-laws a week ago, and we're talking about Easter, and we're talking about Good Friday, and my father-in-law, Art, says, Good Friday's good because forgiveness of sins, number one, a home in heaven, two, in the presence of Jesus here and now, three. And I said, thank you, Lord, and thank you, Art. That's my outline. So we're going to take a look at the words of Jesus. 
because those are three points to remember why Friday is good. Verse 27, Jesus took a cup of wine and gave thanks to God for it, and he gave it to them, and he said, Each of you drink from it, for this is my blood, which confirms a covenant between God and his people. It is poured out as a sacrifice to forgive the sins of many. That's why Good Friday is good. See, God made reality to work in a certain way. And when reality works God's way, reality works. And the problem is, the Bible says we've all gone our own way. We've all come up with our own way to create reality, and we end up wrecking it. Uh, we wreck it with selfishness, we wreck it with pride, we wreck it with hate, we wreck it with lies, we wreck it with lust, we wreck it with greed, we wreck it all kinds of ways. So you know you live in the wreckage every time you read that really, really bad news story. Every time you see that ethical conflict or that moral confusion, every time you get hit by the pang of regret, guilt, shame, every time you want to hide what you've done or what you really think or who you really are. Every time we try to appear to be what we're not, every time we try and run from the past, every time we are fighting against that wrongful desire, we are living in the wreckage. Every time you feel that you have no business being anywhere near God, Every time you believe, you have no business asking God for anything. Every time you're sure you are getting punished again and again and again, you are living in the wreckage. Every time you know you don't have in yourself what it takes to just do the right thing. And Friday is good because he can fix what we broke. And Friday is good because he can clean up what we polluted. And Friday is good because he can pay off what we can't afford. And Friday is good because he can bring to life what we killed. He shed his blood to pay off, clean up, fix our sin problem. And so I'll just ask you a short question. Have you received his forgiveness? Because he died to give it to you as a gift. Have you received it? Do you know that you're forgiven? You might say, oh, pastor, you don't know what I've done. And you know what? I don't have to know what you've done. And you don't have to know what I've done. Because he told us what he's done. I don't know how committed you are. I don't even know how committed I am. We know how committed he is. He went all the way to the cross. He gave his life. He poured out his blood. He made a covenant. He made a binding commitment to make you right in the eyes of God, forgiven. So Friday is good because forgiveness is great. And Friday is good because he opened up a gate to heaven. He opened up a gate to heaven for anybody who wants to follow him through. So verse 29, Jesus says, Mark my words, I will not drink wine again until the day I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. So what does eternal life mean to Jesus? What is eternal life like? It's more than just going to a better place. It's going to a better place with you and the Father where things work the way God intended from the beginning and where it never ends. That's what Jesus thinks eternal life is about. He went to the cross alone so he could take a crowd of friends to the kingdom. 
Friday is good because his momentary pain would lead to your eternal well-being. Friday is good because his temporary abandonment means that the father is going to have a big house with a big table with a really big family. In the morning, Jesus' people would reject him. They would chant and yell and mock and say terrible things. But Jesus is in the process of making people new. Do you know there were probably people there that day who called him terrible things who one day called him Lord? Because he makes people new. In the morning, the Roman Empire would hang him on a cross, but today it's the Roman Empire that's dead and buried. You can find them on the History Channel. But you're not going to find him in a cemetery. His kingdom is still growing, still coming, still good news. Caesar's empire was measured in countries in centuries. Jesus' kingdom cannot be measured. And the disciples, the people who are most committed to Jesus, the people who've spent the most time with Jesus, the people who've sacrificed the most and learned the most and been entrusted with the most, they're all making promises that they're going to break. They're all so confident they're going to win that they're setting themselves up to lose. Peter, his number one guy, is so self-confident could we say so self-righteous that he looks at all of his own friends and Jesus and says, you know, if they all abandon you, not me. And Jesus says three times before sunrise, you'll see you don't even know me. So Jesus is going to be telling the truth at trial while Peter is telling lies by the fire. And while he is being humiliated, they are going to be hiding. And Jesus walks into it anyway because he has got a key that is going to open up a gate to heaven, to an eternal kingdom, and he will welcome in anybody who wants to follow, including all his guys who have totally let him down. He walked into what we run from so that we could stop running. <clears throat> Do you have a confident hope in heaven? Nobody looks forward to the pain or humiliation of the dying process. But do you know what lies on the other side for you? A year and a half ago, we said goodbye to my dad and buried him after a long, miserable battle with Parkinson's. Four months later, we buried my mom after a very short, quick, surprising battle with cancer. There is nothing about the process that's good. It's just hard. But I can tell you this. They were ready to go. They were ready. The Lord had given them a sense of comfort and peace in the midst of death and a confident anticipation of what's to come. They were ready. You don't have to run from death when you're walking with Jesus. Because he's going to walk you right through it. And get you to the other side. So Good Friday is good because their forgiveness of sins is great. And Good Friday is good because he has an eternal home prepared and ready. 
And last, Good Friday is good because you get his presence in the here and now. You don't have to wait to walk with Jesus. You get to start that now. By faith, not by sight, with plenty of surprises and unexpected things along the way. But you don't have to wait to die to go meet God. By his spirit, he's ready to meet you right now. So what did he say in verse 32? He says to him, after I've been raised from the dead, I will go ahead of you to Galilee and meet you there. He knew dead was not done. He knew what he was capable of. The Sanhedrin put him on trial and Pilate put him on a cross and friends and enemies put him in a grave, but nobody put him out of work. He knew what he was going to get done. He knew what he was going to accomplish through all this. For him, laid in a grave was not a permanent retirement. For him, laid in a grave was a three-day layoff. But he was still going to get done everything that he needed to do, which was mostly about changing lives. For him, mourners do not mean the mission is over. He is still Lord. He is still the leader. At the end of Matthew's gospel, the last words of Jesus that Matthew wants ringing in your ears is, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. What he did leads to what he's doing. Do you know what he's doing now? Do you know what he's doing now? He's building a kingdom, and he's changing lives. He's bringing light and life and hope. He gives peace. He gives a new heart. He gives a changed mind. What he did led up to what he's doing, and what he accomplished led up to what he's accomplishing. He is still with us. He still loves us. He still leads. He still forgives. He still teaches. He still changes lives. He is still building his kingdom. And he still invites sinners to become followers. Do you know you're a follower? By faith. Not by your feelings, not by your willpower, but by faith are you following him. My sister wrote a book. <clears throat> it's called, uh, oh, I don't know if this was a good idea. <clears throat> it's called Walking Her Home. Uh, they had a little girl named Grace condition called trisomy 13. Doctor said she'll never make it to term. If she makes it to term, she'll never live to the end of the week. Blind, mute, unable to walk. You can't imagine what that puts parents or a marriage through. The Lord gave them five years four after birth. So she wrote a book about it. This all happened about 10 years ago. <clears throat> and I got the book and I did something I never do. I never do this. I went straight to the last chapter. I skipped the whole first four years and went straight to the last chapter where she tells about the last weeks, days, hours, moments. <clears throat> In those last moments, 
what the Lord gave her was the words of Jesus, not my will, but yours be done. You know where Jesus said that? Not my will, but yours be done. <clears throat> and when they let her go, they knew where she was. Didn't mean it wasn't hard. Doesn't mean it didn't hurt. But she would tell you this. <clears throat> she knows what it means to be forgiven. She knows what it means to have an eternal hope. And she knows the presence of Jesus is for her here and now, no matter what happens. Doesn't mean life's a bed of roses. Doesn't mean everything turns out the way you want. It means that he is with you always, even to the end of the age. Do you have his presence in your life? <clears throat> have you received by faith what he died to give you? Forgiveness of sin, a home in heaven, his presence in your life now. Have you surrendered to his loving leadership? <clears throat> Jesus walked into everything that we run away from. And he did it so you could stop running and walk with him. He's ready to walk with you. And he died to give you forgiveness of sin, a home in heaven, in his presence here and now. And that's why Friday's really good. Really good. So we <clears throat> are going to come to this table soon, this communion table, this Last Supper. And um, it's for believers. It's for people who follow by faith. If you're not a believer, if you're not a follower, we're glad you're here. That's okay. But this is for believers. Because what this is, is a public profession of a personal faith. Now, if you have not been a believer follower, this would be a great time for that to change. This would be a great first profession of faith. This would be a great first steps with him. So what he said is, this bread is his body, broken for you, take and eat. And what he said is, this cup represents his blood, shed as a covenant to make peace between you and God. And if you've never received that before, you could receive it tonight by faith, by just trusting him. If you've never received forgiveness for sin, this is going to sound too simple. Just ask. Just ask. And if you need his presence in your life, surrender to his loving leadership. And so when you come to the table... Confess your sins, yes, but also confess Jesus Christ is Lord. He's your leader. Have you received from Christ what he died to give you? If you have, remember what you've already got. And if you haven't, make tonight the night things turn around for you. Trust him. We are going to share an uh, ancient confession of the Christian faith. Uh, it's called the Apostles' Creed. If your faith is in Christ, we're going to use this as a simple shared testimony to share together, and then we'll pray. Um, would you join me in the creed? I believe in God the Father Almighty maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, 
was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead, ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Let's pray. Uh, Father, uh, we just confess that we need Jesus. You knew it long before we did. And tonight we want to agree with you. We pray, Lord God, that by the blood of Christ you'd wash us clean. That by the victory of Christ you would prepare a place for us. And that by the spirit of Christ you would walk with us and lead us home. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for what you did on our behalf. In your name we pray.